Thank you for this opportunity uh, to be presenting you guys uh, some of the things we have been done, have been doing here in Brazil, right? So this is for those of you, I think some of you may already know uh, our synchrotron, our new synchrotron. So this is a picture of the new synchrotron, right? And the kernel beam line is like this one, right? The last that we have here, the, 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 the one that the longest one, right? So I'm gonna present you some of the things that we have, uh, all of those things are not a uh, single person work. So this is, of course, a presentation on behalf of all of them, right? So just before I start, I'm going to present you the idea of the campus. So we are in a campus called CN Paint. So it's a research material and energy, energy institute, right? And there we have different labs, national labs. We have a nanotechnology lab, uh, a biology lab, and one related to bio -renew -renew renewables and bioenergy, right? And then we, of course, we have also the synchrotron, uh, Brazilian synchrotron light source, right? And I like this picture just to show, to, 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 to demonstrate kind of the, the huge step we have been doing, we have done in the last years coming. This is the old source that we have, right? So. I will show just a quick picture of it, but you can actually, at least for me, because it was such a huge step, we can actually see that the, the entire ring of the previous one fits on this new machine, this new building that we just uh, finishing, right? So after so many years constructing and building and perfecting this machine, we were able to get this resource and make this huge step from a second generation machine to this uh, fourth generation that we have here. So before we start, I just want to show this slide. This is a picture of the old synchrotron. But the reason why I'm showing that is not because I'm uh, because I made my PhD and I'm kind of uh, nostalgic about it, but it's actually to show this graph here, which is just related to a work that we have been done in the imaging beam line that we used to have there, right? So it's a tomography beam line, regular uh, full field illumination, then you take the measurement, and this would be the Fourier shell correlation that we have, just to show the kind of resolution we have, the kind of image we used to uh, provide to users in the old machine, right? And also give you this, the, 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 the scope of how huge it was, how huge it will be for this Brazilian community, this, the, 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 the step forward that we're doing in terms of imaging. Right, because in the end, I'm a microscopy. I'm a guy that likes to make uh, nice photos of things. So that's the kind of thing that I like to show. Concerning the new uh, source that we have here, it's uh, for the, it's a four band, uh, five band acromat, sorry, uh, quadrupoles. More information, of course, I'm not the one with the, the accelerator. So of course, please contact the, 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 the responsible ones, but it's a, uh, uh, quite similar in that sense, uh, machine to the one we have in Sweden, right? In Nanomax. And you can see, I have, I think this seminar is for exactly this kind of discussion, discussions on what we expect for these new machines and how we can better uh, uh, enjoy it and how we can better uh, take part of this development. Now focusing the, on the beam line, right? That's a little bit more comfortable to me. So this is the Canalba beam line. The idea is that it's a coherent X-ray nano-focused beam line, right? Then we have like a source, uh, an undulator source, uh, some focusing. Interesting, uh, in this case, our focusing for to create this uh, secondary source is only in the horizontal, in horizontal, in the vertical direction, we actually see uh, the, the source inside the ring. Right, and then of course we have some slits, a four-band uh, monochromator, right, for uh, for stability, and also it's it's the way it's supposed it's demonstrated here is it's mounted in the horizontal direction to increase, and then we have a representation here that actually uh, is uh, the representation of the end station, uh, but we actually have two end stations. Right, so this KB mirror focusing device and all the detectors that are presented here are actually is split in two. Though those are uh, sequential beam lines, so you you need to choose which one will be you, you're gonna use. But nonetheless, they present different opportunities uh, for for measurements. Both anyway, in both beam lines, the idea is that you can you would be able to measure fluorescence, absorptions, scattering, diffraction, and even luminescence from your sample. And it's as an imaging uh, beam line, the idea is to do 2D mapping, 3D uh, tomography, going for tachography, and even uh, some imaging in bright condition. 
right? Now, some details about the flux and the energy, you can see that, for example, the, about the energy, the beam size, you can see here that uh, we are kind of diffraction limited to some energy, but you can already see the difference between the two beam lines. So the Taro mine station that it's uh, already in under commissioning, and I will present in some of the, how can I say, brand new results that uh, come out. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it, it is not those, it's more versatile and it uh, has a bigger focus, right? And then for the nanoprobe. Really, uh, not no, 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 yeah. This, that, that's why we call it like a submicron uh, probe, right? And then for the nano probe, the Sapochi station, then we have like 30 nanometers uh, focusing around, depending on the the energy. But that's the 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 the, the second st stage that we'll be uh, developing after we finish uh, the Taruma station, right? In terms of flux, so we have 10 to 12, 10 to 11, 10 to 12 flux. Those would be fully coherent flux because we have the slit that select only the coherence, the coherent part of the beam, right? Uh, so now I'm going to focus on the Taruma uh, station, the end, the, the end station itself, uh, that is uh, 136 meters from the source, right? So it's a very crowded space, right? You can already see here that you can't really tell where things are, that's why you need to point a little bit. So the beam will be coming uh, behind this luminescence detector that we have here, right? And then we have the sample. And then you can see how difficult it is to get so much contrast because of the number of detectors that we have to pack everything together. That's part of the challenging, but that's okay. So we're managing that. And then we can see that we have like two fluorescence uh, X-ray detectors. We have a diffraction. Uh, detector with some angular acceptance, transmission one that will be, of course, used for tachography. And just here in the middle, oh yeah, of course. And then we have just optical microscope for of, uh, helping navigating in such a difficult, such a compact environment. But then we have here the sample uh, environment that's zoomed here. Just This is just an example to point out how things, how is how these things can be small. I think most of you are used to, but always impressed me uh, the size of the scale of things because from this part of the design it's easy to see such a draw like this but usually you forget how small thing is and now when you put it your hands on it you can actually see how difficult it will be to to make it uh, to make it fit to make it a proper measurement so but basically this is the basically design I think uh, it's traditional one we have like a normal pin then where you can put your sample uh, but of course, we are also working on different uh, sample holders that uh, will fit different uh, demands, right, for different samples. And I forgot to, to, to mention that the Determinant Station was designed to be an in-air microscope, right, meaning it can make it easier uh, for much of, most of the experiments, right, you don't have to worry about cryogenic conditions, you don't have to worry about vacuum, right, uh, and the energy uh, that it works kind of allow us for to have in that one. Currently, the current situation that we have here, so this is a picture. It should be a couple of uh, weeks old already, but shows most of the things already assembled. It's not so packed, right? Because of course, some of the detectors are not in here. So we only have one vortex a fluorescence detector installed. The other one is in the way. The microscopes are, 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 are set, one of them. The luminescence is not uh, uh, ex, uh, in uh, assemble yet, but that's the, that's the way of things goes, right? So we assemble things. You can see how huge the structure is and how tiny the sample is compared to everything around, right? So this is the main idea. I think this is, will be one of an interesting slide in a sense that I try to bring the numbers uh, for this station. So the transmission detector, for example, it's 1.1 uh, 1 meter. Sorry, this is millimeter. Sorry, not that much. So it's not a sax uh, beam line. So that this one should be millimeter, right? So it's on one meter. It's one meter from the sample, right? And then it would have an angular range from zero to 40 degrees. If you look closer to the sample, then we can see the detectors, so the fluorescence detectors, they have different arrangements. This was in purpose that we have two 
ones, fluorescent detectors, so that we can actually make uh, fluorescence tomography, right? The rotation stage will not is not uh, capable to do uh, 360 rotation. So we just, we went the other way around and make those two detectors working together so that we can actually make 360 rotation, right? For the fluorescence tomography, but the transmission tomography is more than in 180, so it also it's going to be fine. Right. In that sense, we also have this other detector here that's a little bit shadow cover here. This is uh, an also an error detector. So that would allow us to measure not only the transmitted beam, but also diffraction uh, simultaneously. Of course, you can also choose to do this uh, diffraction measurement using the main detector. This detector that we have here is an in-house development. I show Data what we can uh, we have been working on, but it has like uh, more than uh, 1,050 pic uh, 1,500 1, pixels, right? And then we have of course this small one that's only 512 uh, pixels pixel side, right? And then the microscopes and the luminescence one that we are developing. So I think this is one shows a little bit of the possibilities that we uh, envisions with new techniques with uh, the possibility of doing simultaneous measurements. So the, the scope of the, 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 this beam line is to do almost all, uh, as much as we can, uh, simultaneous measurements, right? So the detectors are designed not to interfere with one another. That's why we're so packed uh, together. In terms of uh, detector, it was an in-house uh, development. So this is actually uh, this slide is not mine. This is from the, the Jean Poli, which is the head of the detector group. He is uh, developing together with a Brazilian company this area detector for us, right? And then it comes on different sizes, right? But I think the most interesting part is the pixel size, which is five, 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 55 microns, kind of traditional ones, right? But they are in modular ones, meaning we can make small ones like this one and bigger ones that I think even Carla, when she presented like the Caterete beam line, she probably mentioned, uh, she did mention this detector here, which is a huge one. And that's that's the good thing to have this Brazilian company joining us on this development. Now we have our own detectors, which is a critical point and serves most uh, serves almost all beam lines that we have uh, at, the, at, the, at the series uh, right now. Server environment. I mentioned that uh, the Taruman is an in-air microscope, right? So it's now that, of course, we can measure regular samples. We wanted to do more than that. So we have different sample environments. Most of them are already in prototyping, meaning I'm showing these ones. I'm showing that those are actually draw uh, technical drawings with a lot of details. Some of them are already revolved in simulations for thermal and mechanical stabilities and actually being manufactured already, prototyping and everything. This one I'm showing here that's, it was supposed to be rotating. It's a special case that I'm here. I just brought here because it's one of the, the projects that I'm mostly involved. So this is a prototype that the idea is to create an environment where you could make the tomography uh, of a root system, right? The plant, and then you can focus on the capillary where you would guide your root and make a proper tomography, not only for imaging, because remember, as I mentioned, fluorescence is a thing. So guys would love to see the elements turning, going back and forth around the root and everything, right? This is the cryogenic setup. That's another one that uh, I'm mostly involved. You can see it because it's an in-air microscope means you have a lot of, uh, it's, it's not easy to be, uh, uh, you don't need really need to have cryogenics, but of course you're gonna want that, right? So we need to come up with a solution so that we use a mod. I mean, it's a traditional cryo stream uh, setup with a lot of things around it. So to make it work on this geometry, right? It, it took a lot of uh, simulations to see the best way of taking this uh, this cold air away from the stagings and protecting, and even developing some extra protection to the sample so that the flux, uh, although it keeps everything uh, safe from, from freezing, from icing, it may, of course, disturb the, the sample a little bit. So we 
add also to protect not only the states, but if necessary, we could protect the sample uh, inside a small dome that we have, uh, we are developing here. Atmosphere, atmospheric and electrochemistry is of course part of the deal and we have a lot of developments on that too, right? And of course the whole idea of have this bunch of uh, sample environments on this microscope is because we are trying to cover the, the, the main uh, scientific cases that we identify some of them being more, uh, even more, more uh, important for Brazil, like for example, this soil science and uh, plant science that we have, environmental and agricultural science that we have here, right? So now finally for what exactly do we have right now, right? We have a little bit more, of course, we have more than that, what I'm showing here. These ones are results from the last year Right, a lot of things had already happened from there, but I, this, I decided to brought these ones because it was like a nice story to tell. Okay, so Karnaúba beam, the Karnaúba beam line had hit its first light on October, right, the end of October, right, and then we start to doing the commission. When I say we, I said a bunch of people, not only the beam line uh, staff, but we have a whole engineering and support groups uh, for doing that. Then we start commissioning. And the guys managed to make it work until in December 10th, uh, we managed to have our first image. I know it may look a little bit silly, but it, at least for us, I was there. It was a nice moment because we finally saw something that uh, reflect all the, the effort that we have been doing on designing and everything. The resolution wasn't so great. The resolution was actually worse than the one we had before. Not that much worse, but the one we had in the previous one. But it was, was it's still very nice to see things coming to be. To be honest, actually, the, we had a uh, scanning fluorescence on the, the on at the, view, the old source, and the resolution was uh, 25 microns. So, I guess we already make a pretty good job in a sense that we are pushing things already further than what we had before. But of course, people would not be happy if you only stay on the micrometer. So after some efforts, uh, the beam was reduced to around 500, uh, 500 nanometer, right? And then we managed to make some nice fluorescence imaging of this Siemens star here that it's a kind of a pattern that we have here. And this was done just before, uh, I mean, in the last week, right? In the last week that we had uh, available on 2020, and it was an effort. Then finally, we managed to gather in December 16, we managed to gather something like this that I'm showing here, right? It's not a beautiful uh, scattering, there's a lot of things around, has a lot of things happening, but gave us the, the possibility to do tychography, right? So we managed to make some tychography, and this was actually at the last day uh, of the year, right? It was the, the last beam that we had, we even, we wasn't able to make, to, to be sure that this would happen. Of course, seeing structure like this is scattering around, made, made us some uh, promise, uh, it was kind of a promising, but actually the imaging took us a while to be reconstructed. And the reconstruction was done by the scientific computing group. So that's, uh, thank you, more specific to, to a guy called Giovanni right? Uh, uh, it's a very nice guy. I always talk to him and everything. We discuss this kind of things. So a lot of tries and error, trying to find the proper parameters. It's a very intense, but he managed to, to find the proper parameters to reconstruct the Siemens star to a much higher resolution. Of course, this 30 nanometer makes no sense. It's just like a pixel size is not a proper resolution. If you look closer to the image, you can see that the resolution is not isotropic. Of course, uh, I have been looking for this picture for a while, but that was very nice. And then, uh, of course, we have a lot of incoherent modes, which just show that there is a lot of work to be done to clean everything in the, uh, in the beam line, but it works. I think this was the, the, the main message that I would like to bring here. So it is working, comparing with the fluorescence that we have here, it works and we had a very nice uh, news for the, the end of the year. Although independent of how it was difficult, it turned out very nice by the end, right? So that was Taruma. 
this is just a slide, a presentation for the, the, the second one, the Sapochi, which would be for scanning and tachography, right? Uh, all done with, uh, and also uh, integrated with tomography, right? It's an in-vacuum, ultra-high vacuum, cryogenic microscope. The same detectors, fluorescence one, transmission that I'm showing here, but of course inside we are uh, finding ways to put the Xeon uh, optical luminescence inside and of course some of others detector for intensity if it's necessary to make the measurements in vacuum uh, regarding for example the transmission right it's not on a shell uh, i'm showing the shell but i decided to show these two images here that showing that we already have stuff uh, inside actually we already have stuff that have been built and designed and are part of in a commissioning stage right in there and this one would be that old pin that I showed you guys before here, just to give some uh, sense of where things will fix, right? So, and finally, just quick, before I, I have finish. a quick, quick question. Does that have a cryo transfer where you bring the sample in already frozen? Yes, yes. So this yellow part here, it's a cryo transfer chamber, right? Uh, if you look at closer here, I don't know if you guys are familiar, this would be the Leica VCT500 uh, transfer yeah. system. Yeah. Right? For Thanks. the vacuum bag. Vacuum case, sorry. So, Thanks. yeah, that's the, the main point. That's maybe this not only for radiation damage, but also to keep the sample uh, this is on cryogenic condition for the entire uh, life cycle, right, of the sample. Any question? That's fine. Okay. That's good. So, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, and now the questions, what we, do we do? Why we don't have a beamline, right? So this is just a true played around that I made, I mean, with numbers, right? This one is uh, motivated by the guys from the soil that I mentioned to you. So the soil people, they would love to measure phosphorus, fluorescence from phosphorus, but the phosphorus is like a, the hard thing to do, right? Because the energy, the fluorescence energy is so low that you most likely won't be able to, 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 to actually see anything, right? Except for, for uh, the surface of it. But the guys keep asking, wow, I would really, really love to have some kind of 3D information. That would be very nice to have some kind of tomography. And then, well, after some, some discussions, he kind of, I kind of convinced him that it would be okay to have some kind of tomography, not in the entire surface, but at least something that will be around it, like a shell, through the information, like in, that's why we call it annular tomography, some kind of tomography on this annular region. And then said, okay, well, it's better than nothing, better than just doing 2D mapping that's usually done. And of course, this would apply for other cases, like uh, if you really don't have to measure this region, you can save that, and if you really don't really to touch that region because of those, you don't act. You don't have to 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 concern. Of course, you will still have fluorescence uh, around this region, but at least the direct beam will not be touching anything in this region, right? And then we made some simulations. It turns out to be very okay to do those simulations. Uh, some optimizations had to be done, right? To have a proper cover to to actually measure. Uh, all the the, 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 the the pixels that you are interested in. And I just realized that I put the wrong, uh, sorry about that. You can see that this one is not the optimized uh, beam coverage here. It has some, a little bit of, uh, of uh, miss uh, regions, but nonetheless, you can actually see that the reconstruction look fine, right? So it's okay, probably it's gonna work. We are waiting for the beam line to actually test this idea and see if you manage to do that. No big deal, just playing around with numbers. And then we have this another this other development here doing conjunction with the optics group and the beamline design group. The idea is to see how far we can go uh, on actually uh, aligning the, the beamline, right? So the idea is to use uh, a tachographic measurement and from that use the Zernic polynomial composition to actually understand where it is and then retrofit it using machine learning to actually align the beamline. What we have done so far, so far, because we're of course waiting for the beamline, we have uh, to create the, the base, right? For you to do 
this training, let's put it that way. And for that, we use like beamline simulation uh, using SRW package. It's it's one of the version of it is this nice coding, like uh, connecting things, but this is not exactly just for illustration here. But the idea is that you miss a line, your uh, optics, then you go for a proper Zenith polynomial decomposition on this square aperture, of course, because you're using KB murals. And then you can actually see what this misaligned meant in terms of different uh, aberrations that we would have. So far then we have the assembly error, meaning that this is all the errors with respect to the both KB murals that are inside, uh, uh, that are the beam line. And how uh, this, uh, how is the assembling error concerning all the, 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 the possible strategies that they have been developed in terms of uh, uh, misalignment on the position of the KB mirrors, sorry. And then of course we run some quick simulations on that. We track all most of these positions. You can see there's a lot of possibilities, a lot of things going on, but this is, would be the, 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 the first machine learning validation that we have in that. Meaning that for, of course, this uh, has also simulated data because you use for validation, but they are not used for training. Meaning that in this case, for all those, those cases, it had like a maximum error of 3.5%, right? So we would be missing uh, all, any of these numbers here as so far by a 3.5%. Uh, percent, right? And but we still develop, we're still uh, going for uh, not only, of course, measurements to see if we can actually take this from the, 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 the tachography measurement, but also uh, try to increase the errors and how we manage to, to fit uh, this problem. So, with that, I think uh, I'm finished. Uh, I want to say thank you. This is not a slide, uh, this is actually a slide for the people back home here in Brazil. So this is part of the, 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 this is the Carnauba team, right? And just part of it, you can see how big it is. And this is part of the people, uh, optical group, engineering and so forth. So all of those guys actually made it this happen, right? And manage and age, uh, most of the things work. So, and now for you, the audience, I say thank you too. Uh, and I'm open for questions. I hope I haven't been too fast. Thank you so much. Uh, this was very nice, concise, and so there leaves lots of space for discussion. We have already a question from Richard Sandberg. Well, well when will you get beam uh, at the beam line? Yeah, so, oh, stop, I'm sorry. How can I stop this? Pause share? No, no. Okay, stop share. Can you guys see me? Yes. Okay, so that depends. We already have been at the beam line, of course, but that was made in a, in a little bit rush. Uh, so for this uh, first part of the year, we kind of reworked most of the things that had been done, but the beam is already, should be in the, 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 the Tarumon station already, right? I think the proper question, question is when we're gonna start doing measurements and that would be most likely in the next months because we now we are going to run proper experiments for validation and actually trying to see things that may have some scientific uh, impact in that sense. And of course, make sure the beamline it's, it's working on all of its different uh, possibilities. So I would say by this semester, we may be starting experiments. For users, well, that's, that's another question. That's, I think it's too uncertain to actually put it anything like that. Maybe, I don't know if any of my colleagues from home would like to, to point that, to say anything, but I personally don't like to really put a date uh, when we'll be open because of what actually happened in the last years and it's still happening. Thank you. Actually, I would like to congratulate with you and the whole team for this. It's a quite, a, quite a, an achievement in small time from October to December to get all this. And uh, yeah, all the best for the future. We have a question from Lucas. Lucas, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Yeah, so first, a nice, uh, nice presentation. Thank you. My question is regarding the Thurman station. Uh, it was not clear for me which rotation axis you have for a sample. For instance, okay. uh, 
My, uh, I mean, I wonder if you if you can rotate your if you can rotate your sample around chi, like around the optical axis, or no, that that, that was my fault actually. I, I missed on mention that. Uh, so we have like uh, the possible well, the beamline itself. It's made to do only the tomography uh, rotation, right? Uh -huh. So it will be th that's the beamline that what I showed you, but we have space for uh, goniometers, and we actually are developing the, 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 the necessary envir environment to have some rotations in the chi and the other ones, right? Because we understand that, of course, if we are proposing to do diffraction, we need to have all these other uh, 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 freedoms for actually aligning the sample. So we have, it won't be like uh, full chi, but it's close. Uh, what, it, what does it mean is that you would need to pre-align your sample outside of the beam line, right? But then we would have some free, some degree for you to optimize that in respect to the rest. Okay, at least a few degrees, but- uh, Oh yeah. So, sorry, sorry, uh, can, can I make a follow-up question? Uh, so you, you said that the, the Tyrman station is designed for tomography, but the Sapoti station, uh, I also didn't, didn't follow if you have this. No, both of the beam line are designed for tomography, right? The idea is that it's a microscopy beam line and what we understand that like X-ray microscopy, it's tomography, right? Being that uh, transmission tomography or fluorescence tomography, right? So all of them have, the, the thing is some, uh, because of the cables and the, the stability we're looking for, we are not able to do 360 rotation, right? That should be okay for transmission tomography, but it's kind of a problem for fluorescence one. That's why we have two detectors and they should complement one another, mean giving you a fake 360 uh, view, right? 360 rotation of your sample. Uh -huh. but, the, but the Sapoti station is, uh, you said it's for scanning diffraction. So you probably have like a translation for sort the of sample. Uh, oh yeah, of course. You have translation in in, in, in uh, the plane. We we of course because it's the scanning beam line, meaning that you wanna have to scan the sample uh, in front of the beam. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, but the, the Sapochi station is a, is, a, is a scanning and tachography one, right? That uh -huh. you can position your detector for some diffraction angle. Aha, uh -huh, but you 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 have only one degree of freedom for your detector. Yeah, in that sense, yes. Okay. That would be the 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 the, two okay. the, the theta direction for the detector. Okay, okay. Think, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Salvador Ferrer. Um, what about the control of the sample drift in the nanoprobe? Uh, do you have interferometry? Is it an active control? Yeah, so we have a bunch of, of uh, detectors. So both for, uh, it's a closed loop, of course, and everything for both stations. And for the Sapoti, it's even Taruma, it also has some interferometric uh, sensors. Redundance uh, is also one thing that we try to, to, to make it, right? Because, okay, for the Sapoti one, uh, we have only small range and everything. It's very, it's, it's kind of limited in that sense. So more for special samples. That's why, why uh, I, uh, we have focused more in Taruma because it's much more versatile and should uh, targets much uh, easily, much easier, right? Easily uh, different scientific problems, right? So we have different stages, the coarse stage and uh, fine stage. Both of them have either capacitive sensors or interferometric sensors, right? And for the Sapochi station, we also have interferometric sensors and the position. One thing that we that had a lot of put they people put a lot of effort on was actually to make a proper uh, thermal uh, uh, to look at what uh, what 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 they would be the implications of any thermal drift and what would you get uh, with these thermal models and everything, right? So Sapoti, of course, is going for the highest resolution because you have much more control in it, right? It's the cryogenic condition is not only because of the, the sample itself, but it's also to have a proper reservoir to cool down and control the temperature uh, of most of the things inside, right? So it's not only, of course, we understand that the motors may generate heat, 
but then we use this cold reservoir to control the temperature of almost all the involved components uh, in that, minimizing drifts and everything. So that was one of the concerns that we have, right? That's why you're aiming for so, uh, aiming for very, very high resolution at the, the support station. Thank you. Next, I think, was uh, Manuel. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Hi, Manuel. Hi, Carlos. It was very nice talk. Thank you very much. And also, I think I want to extend Dina's uh, congratulations because it's very impressive to have from first light to first typography in three months. So, and but I have to, to point one thing. This is first light, but the guys manage a very nice work on aero budgeting. So, I, that, that, uh, I have a table that I showed you, they have that same table for almost all components on the beam line, right? right? So they actually know what they are doing when they are putting things in the, the beam path. It, I was very impressed too. We have a few things to learn for the upgrade of SLS as well to, to manage such efficiency. But I wanted to ask you uh, for the Sapochi beamline, when do you think you would have uh, already tychographic tomography running there or estimate of course in these days is very difficult to know with much certainty and i also was curious maybe i missed it what are the target resolution and sample sizes that you have for the high resolution okay. 3d imaging so not this year <laughs> all right so we are actually put the the, the sapoti project on hold right right now because we're focusing on the month, which is a good thing because me and we are actually learning a lot of things, right? And we plan to 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 restart. Let's put it that way. To to start to to get back to the project by the next semester, right? But in any case, it won't be operational. I mean, maybe we can try to push, like we did last last year, right? But as I said, it was just like a way of showing, right? To end the year it was such a hard year, so we. We need to have something to, to show and something to, to be right to presenting, right? And that was the goal. That's why we kind of revisit most of the things. So it's not going to be this uh, this uh, the next year. The best thing I can mention to you, it's actually what would be the numerical aperture of the detector, right? Because we said resolution. That's it. I think it, unless we also manage... the specification to... for the positioning would be relevant. So the detector... Okay, and the yeah. No, no, that's... Yeah. Everything will be around nanometer, right? So the resolution is around nanometer, and then the position is also uh, going for that target, right? So I would say units of nanometers. That's that's the goal in terms of positioning and in terms of detector. If, you, of course, we have signal to that, uh, up to that in terms of scattering, that's another issue but we are trying to go for act one nanometer but that's 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 like for the numbers one nanometer would be great for us thanks thanks a lot uh constantin yeah thank you uh yeah hello um i guess you will be using variable polarization uh, can you tell how because we are uh, right now we don't have that but the beamline was designed with a delta on the later yeah, this, this is why I'm asking this. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we are developing our delta on the laser in is an in-house development. So we so remember when I mentioned the, the previous beam, the previous source, it wasn't like a second generation ish because we had an ondulator in that. So we developed the ondulator for that, and now we are developing the delta ondulator for this new beam line. So you can actually see that the fraction is in plane, it's not uh, in the vertical axis. That's one of the the reasons too, so we push for stability in that sense, then we choose to change the polarization and then be able to make the diffraction in plane. But it, is, it, it will still be linear. No, yeah, I mean, you could choose uh, with that, so we have the possibility to have linear polarization in the vertical direction. Okay, thank you. Next in line is Virginie, please unmute yourself. Hi, hello, hello Dina, hello Carlos. Um, hello. Thank you very much for, for the nice talk. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that you are going to implement bright typography and uh, I, I would like to, 
to, to know a little bit more how you are planning to do it and, uh, and, and, and where and so on? Well, first of all, asking for your help, right? For trying, because <laughs> it's a very impressive presentation. So I was even discussed with Dina. So if I could uh, mention that, that the Beamline, of course, when it was first designed and conceptualized, all these techniques were boring, right? It may sometimes do not even exist. And we try to push some, some, for some design that's uh, versatile in that sense, right? Concerning black, black typography, I definitely would need some help, right, for developing. I asked my supervisor to, to, to be able to, to, to go in that direction. He said, of course, it's a very nice technique. You should try. I don't know if I made the right choice, but then the idea is, of course, to, to try to follow your steps, right, in that sense. And from that, I would definitely need your help. Uh, and I hope, of course, you would, if you have any comments, you have any, if you need any further details to, to, to on that, we can discuss. And I hope that the hardware that we have, it's, it's good enough for, for your technique. Okay. That's the main okay. <laughs> Uh, it, it was not really not the, the the direction of my questions. I was really just curious to to hear your thoughts and so on because, as Stephen has uh, has mentioned uh, in his previous presentation, this uh, coherent seminar, uh, right typo is, is is quite tricky and uh, it really requires yeah. some some manpower actually for finding the right um, uh, the right button where to push more than on the experimental part, but really on the inversion part. So this is where the, the manpower should be on the Synchrotron side, I guess. But so, yes, of course, yes, why not? Yeah, the, 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 luckily for us, we have a very, a very strong scientific computing uh, okay. division, right? Yeah. That uh, also would be interested on, on going okay. for the algorithm because I remember you said this is kind of the, the, the one of the critical parts. Yeah. So, but I understand that comes together with a proper instrumentation. So okay. Yeah. I hope we can actually uh, develop much more uh, discussions on that. Um, okay. I'm glad I get your attention. 